Hello, and welcome everyone. My name is Dr. Frank Levecchio. I'm the Medical Director of Clinical Research at ASU's College of Health Solutions. Pathetically, I'm board certified in four specialties and received, received the Mass in Public Health from Harvard Medical School. Um, I've received dozens of teaching awards, and in 2022, I was fortunate enough to be named one of the top 2% of scientists who were cited. Um, I've received grants in drug development, toxicology, infectious disease, and environmental illness. And this topic that we're talking about today is very near and dear to my heart, and I'm trying to understand it better. Hopefully, both of us will uh, understand it when, when we're done. I'd like to thank you for joining our Health Talks webinar brought to you by the College of Health Solutions at ASU. Our college works to address the challenges facing people and communities to stay healthy, improve their health, and manage their chronic diseases. These health talks are one way to serve the community with timely and relevant educational information that also provides continuing education credit at no cost to you. So a few housekeeping uh, notes. You probably know where all your bathrooms are, but uh, first, this session is being recorded and it'll be posted on our website, asuhealthtalks.com. After the panelist discussion, I'll moderate a short Q&A session. Please submit your questions via Zoom's Q&A feature and not the chat box, so not the chat box. Finally, you re will receive a brief survey asking about you know, how we did today. And if you're requesting continued ed education credits, this must be done in order for you to receive credits. Okay. If you're not applying for credits, we still would appreciate your feedback. We want to know how we can make this better. So I'm so excited to have two fabulous professors with us today. Joining me today, in no particular order, is Candace Lewis. Uh, Candace Lewis is an assistant professor and dual appointment in the School of Life Sciences and Department of Psychology here at Arizona State University. Her research demonstrates the impact of early life social experiences on epigenetic regulation of gene systems involved in mental health and how it impacts brain structure, function, microbe, composition, and behavior. Her research also focuses on the potential of psychedelic assisted therapy to reduce symptoms through psychological healing and epigenetic alterations. She's been fortunate enough to, to be funded by the Science Foundation of Arizona, the Fulbright Association, and the National Institute of Health. So we are very, very excited to have her. Candace will be followed by Sarah Menenga. Sarah Menenga earned her PhD from ASU's Behavioral Neuroscience Program in 2015 from the Psychology Department. She then completed a postdoc and held a faculty position for three years at NYU's Langone Grossman School of Medicine before returning to ASU's School of Life Sciences this past summer. Sarah has more than 15 years of experience in rodent research and seven years exper experience studying the effects of psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy in clinical populations, including people with alcohol use disorder and people with cancer diagnosis, coinciding with anxiety or coexisting with anxiety and mood disorders. Her current research is in the brain epigenetic epigenetics and altered states lab with our presenter, Candace Lewis. She's focusing on back translation of clinical findings into rodent models for the purpose of understanding mechanisms. So we are so, so fortunate to have both of these health experts with us today to talk about psychedelics as therapeutics, current science and clinical applications. So hopefully by the end of this, we're going to try to answer, do psychedelic drugs offer effective treatment options for healthcare providers and their patients? Mind-altering drugs like ketamine, psilocybin, MDMA, also known as ecstasy or molly, have sparked controversy within our college and within healthcare fields for decades. Today, these drugs are widely studied as possible treatments for health challenges such as addiction, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder. In today's webinar, our health experts explore the evidence-based science, benefits and risks behind the psychedelic usage in clinical care. So our first presenter is Candace Lewis with a presentation titled MDMA, Basic Science and Clinical Research. And I joyfully give the mic to Dr. Lewis. Thank you so much for that introduction. 
Um, seeing as this is a bur burgeoning field with many compounds, um, we decided to focus on two of the most prevalent happening in research right now. Therefore, my talk's going to cover basic science through clinical applications of MDMA. So for a quick overview of what we'll be talking about today, first I'm going to introduce you to the compound of MDMA, and we're, then we're going to move into the modern clinical trials that are covering it. We'll, put, we'll talk about published uh, research that suggests potential mechanisms of treatment response to MDMA. After a summary of those points, then I will uh, talk to you briefly about some bear lab initiatives that are happening right here at Arizona State University involving psychedelic assisted therapy. So first, MDMA, um, also known as ecstasy or molly, is structurally similar to mescaline, which is a classic psychedelic. It's also structurally similar to stimulants and endogenous neurotransmitters. It's known to increase ne both neurotransmitter and hormone activity, um, which is which leads to powerful pro-social subjective effects of emotional openness. Because of this very unique pharmacological and behavioral profile, it has gained attention as names such as intactogen, empathogen, or entheogen to really highlight the unique openness and, um, and enjoyment of closeness and spirituality while on this substance. Right now in the literature, its primary indication is for post-traumatic stress disorder. So a brief history, its first synthesis was in 1912 from a German pharmaceutical company called Merck. And for the next 40-ish uh, years, they kind of kept it in-house, studying it for its different indications of different, different mechanisms of it. Uh, its first evidence of recreational use on the streets didn't happen until 1970 when drugs were seized by police in Chicago. Tablets had MDMA within them. And then really after that is where we see the origination of MDMA being used amongst therapists. That started in 1977 when the famous Alexander Shulgin chemist gave it to his friend Leo Zeff, who then was like, this is amazing. This could be really great for psychotherapy. Leo Zeff started creating his own protocols and sharing it with therapists among, in, within California. In 1978, we see our first MDMA human trial published. This is again with Shulgin and a well-known figure in the field also, Nichols. Um, but we don't start seeing the clinical trials happen, the psychotherapy clinical trials happen until the early 80s. These trials, while not held up to the same standards of today, um, so they were not placebo controlled. However, they showed effective use within individual, couple, and group therapy. That was quickly put to an end by 1985 when the DEA, when the DEA made it a scheduled one substance in response to increased street use. Schedule one is a indication that it has no medical use whatsoever and is a dangerous compound. So that is the brief history. However, I think there's a lot of nuance in that history that I think is important for us to understand. One is that the West Coast clinical use was widespread before it became regulated substance. Therapists in this area, in this area, in this um, during this time, referred to it as Adam empathy or penicillin for the soul highlighting how it induced a, um, a very vulnerable state in an increased communication and reduced fear response within the therapy. There was high consensus within this clinical community of the efficacy of using it. In fact, a survey done by Darlene Harlow um, showed that therapists mostly, mostly said that it induced less projection, rigidity, and defensiveness during the therapy session and more acceptance and ego strength. Also, when the MDMA went, or when the DEA went to schedule MDMA, there was large opposition in the medical community, which can be seen by this pretty hilarious timeline. In July 1984 is when the DEA announces that they're going to be recommending MDMA for Schedule 1. Only two months later, a group of physicians, researchers, and therapists request a hearing because they want to fight this, this decision. In 1985, after the hearings have ended, a judge recommends to the DEA after hearing all the evidence that it should be Schedule 3 placement. The DEA does not abide. It goes on to Schedule 1. And within the year, we see the creation of the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, which is a nonprofit group called MAPS. And their whole purpose was to, um, was to try to continue the scientific research of psychedelic studies for the use of psychotherapy. So jumping into the modern research trials of the first phase one and phase two PTSD clinical trials for MDMA, MAPS is the sponsor and the leader of all of the trials going forward that we're going to talk about. So you can see what a big player MAPS has been in this, in this field. 
In 2010, the first phase one trial was published. This was looking at treatment resistant PTSD. They looked at an inactive placebo versus two to three MGMA sessions um, with a moderate dosing and a sample size of 20 individuals. Their remission rates for their outcome showed that 83% of their MGMA group had PTSD remission. So the symptoms went so far down that they were clinically, re um, clinically no longer had PTSD as compared to the 25% in the placebo group. In 2013, they did a long-term follow-up study um, based on the, the, the sample size from this first study. The long-term follow-up data was collected anywhere between 1.5 and six years after the initial study. 84% of the MGMA group completed the study, and there they showed that the average PTSD rating score towards at the end of the study, which was um, 24.6, had not significantly changed in all of that time. So of those who received the MGMA and who were uh, had remission at the end of the study, that did not change for them over a long period of time. Next, in 2019, there is a publication of phase two clinical trials, and it is the um, it is the collapsed across six different trials across five different sites. There, they either use an inactive placebo or an active control, um, which is something we can talk about more after this talk if you guys have questions about why. Again, their model is two to three MGMA sessions. They brought in the range a little bit and our sample size goes up to 103. And again, we show really impressive remission rates where at the end of all of this, the MDMA group had 54% remission compared to the placebo group, which had 23% remission. This was the data that um, that, so that uh, the FDA decided was, was, was novel enough that they gave MDMA breakthrough therapy status. Um, this happened in 2017 based on that data. In 2020, again, they published a long-term follow-up study. In this one, all of the follow-up data was collected 12 months after the original study. 88% of our MDMA group completed the study. And we see that the remission rate um, that was 56 at the end of the study actually increased to where 12 months later, they showed more of their patients had a remission of PTSD. Again, showing this long-term effect of the therapy. So moving into where we are today in 2023, MAPS has published two separate phase three clinical trials. On the left, you're seeing their first one. They included in this trial, PTSD uh, patients who register as either moderate to severe. And again, we show that this um, at baseline, these are our two groups. And even after the first session, further after the second session, and then it remains about stable after the third session, our MGMA group is decreasing in their PTSD symptomology much more than the placebo group. This is the second uh, clinical trial they published this year. This was restricted to those with severe PTSD, and we see the same pattern happening there. So what is the treatment model? A lot of people have questions about this. We get, it, um, we get these questions all the time. So first, for the MAPS clinical trials for MDMA and PTSD, they have a published manual. Um, it's largely based on recommendations that came from therapists who were doing this work in the 80s. So anyone can go look at their manual. But to give you the summary and the high points of it, it is largely a non-directive therapy method. Um, the patient is, is encouraged to lay there and, and engage in an internal reflection while wearing eye shades and listening to music. There is a large emphasis, large, on the therapist team. It is always two people um, having, a, having empathetic rapport and empathetic presence um, during these sessions. There's also an emphasis on somatic manifestations of trauma and how they might arise during the MGMA sessions. And the therapists are encouraged to use evidence-based methods to address this, such as touch, body work, breathing, and music. And then lastly, the the manual compares many of its therapeutic elements to other models such as cognitive behavioral therapy, EMDR, and psychodynamic therapy. There are three types of sessions that always go in this order, your preparation sessions, your support sessions, and your integration sessions. During, that, um, during preparation se sessions, there are usually three of them that last 90 minutes. The point is to build rapport, discuss expectations, encourage a curiosity reaction to the experience and prepare the patients for revisiting their trauma. During the dose sessions, which happen in monthly intervals and go on for eight hours, again, the therapist is supposed to facilitate rather than direct. 
And one of their main goals is to create and maintain a safe alliance and, of course, provide support, support for when difficult processing may, came up, may come up. And it also is also stated and important that they validate their patients' resolutions and their moments of joy and heart opening. And then there is a check-in at the peak effects of 60 minutes. After that, they have three uh, integration sessions of 90 minutes each, one the morning after, and then two during the following month. And this is to further integrate and discuss and process the experiences that were catalyzed during the MGMA treatment sessions. So that's the clinical research happening right now. It is exciting. Um, lar by and large, everyone expects that the FDA will be will be approving this, this indication for MGMA within the next coming years. However, on the research side of it, we still have a lot of knowledge gaps and everyone's pretty aware of that. So one of the major ones is the administration platform. As you can see, the, the most opposite, op op um, the the best dose and the number of sessions is yet to be determined. Also, the therapeutic method. Um, I think there are those that would like it to be a little bit more concrete, so or at least measuring against different methods. Also, in these trials, all of the patients are taken off of any prior drug treatments before they can join the trial. Therefore, drug-drug interactions are largely unknown. And as is true in most of these trials, um, the the samples were not that diverse. They were primarily white, primarily middle age, um, and also not a lot of comorbidities. However, there were allowed some throughout. And then there's mechanism, um, which is what Sarah and I's lab is really interested in investigating and really unpacking the mechanism behind the treatment effects of this. Why? I get this question all the time. I've gone through my whole career. Why do we care about biological mechanisms? If the clinical reduction is there, then what does it matter? One, it is becoming increasingly important for the whole healthcare system to be able to provide evidence for biological mechanisms. This comes into play when it comes to regulation, insurance, and access to medical treatments. But I think what's even more important, well, that's important too, but also understanding the mechanisms of symptom reduction is going to inform our etiology of these complex psychiatric disorders in which we we still, um, it's still a, an area of high interest within mental health research that we don't really understand the pathways very well to, to, to disorder developments. Understanding what reverses symptoms will help us understand what leads to symptoms and knowing that is the only way we can effectively um, plan and plan prevention strategies. So right now, what are the mechanisms of treatment effects for MGMA and PTSD? There are two main hitters that I'm going to talk to you about that are throughout the literature, and one has to do with the rapid effects on neurotransmitters and hormones, which basically place the patient into a state that enhances the therapeutic experience through therapeutic alliance, the reduction avoidance, and the increased feeling of safety, making the therapeutic um, experience actually just more effective. Second is its uh, molecular effects and neurocircuitry effects having to do um, targeting the fear response system. This fear response system is, um, is known to be dysregulated in PTSD, and there is evidence that MDMA is actually working on that same system to reverse that dysregulation. Lastly, um, preliminary evidence from our lab in collaboration with MAPS suggests that a potential of altered epigenetic regulation of stress genes within the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis um, may also be driving some of these long-term decreases in symptoms that we see. So I'm going to unpack the evidence for you for these three mechanisms. So the first being the rapid effects on neurotransmitters and hormones, as we've already kind of talked about, MDMA is really unique in its pharmacological and downstream behavioral profiles. And with that, it leads, it has the potential to lead to a deeper psychotherapeutic process. Um, the patient is feeling heightened feelings of empathy, love, compassion, safety, and connection, which allows them to go into that, that trauma processing. The effects that MDMA has on neurotransmitters, such as serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine, um, which are highly, which all regulate mood, reward, and arousal, puts the patient into a therapeutic state in which their mood and reward and arousal to in to um, participate in the therapeutic um, in the therapeutic discussion is more more applicable. Also, MDMA's effects on hormonal systems such as oxytocin, known as the love drug, vasopressin, prolactin, and cortisol all make it so that the social behavior and bonding between the patient and the um, and the therapist is heightened and they are able to be more in the presence and feel safe in that trauma processing also towards themselves. 
um, patients are able to have a lot more of that trust and bonding and grace towards themselves during the trauma processing. The next mechanism being targeting the neurocircuitry of the fear response. So again, the dysregulation of the circuit is well established within PTSD. Um, in a simplified version, this typically has to do with the medial prefrontal cortex, um, which is really our cognitive control, amygdala, which is our emotional reactions, and the hippocampus, which is storing context-dependent memories. So within PTSD, um, and again, simply, we know that there's decreased activity within the medial prefrontal cortex, which predicts PTSD severity. We also know that there's increased amygdala responsivity to threats, and this increase in, re in amygdala responsivity also is predictive of the PTSD severity. And then within the hippocampus, we see decreased activation for memory encoding and retrieval, and a lot of evidence of decreased volume within the hippocampus as well. So how do we study this circuit in, um, in animals? So we, we can study the circuit in PTSD patients with human with neuroimaging methods, but with animals, it's really important um, for us to be able to look at actual tissue and molecular changes. So a well-established animal model is fear conditioning, which is a simple Pavlonian um, model in which animals are exposed to a trauma. It's like a pain source here showing shock. In, um, in addition to a cue exposure. So this is modeling the actual traumatic experience. The animals then go on to receive cue exposure with no shock, and this is called extinction. And then we are able to expose them again to the same context and cue, measure their fear response. And this is the way that we can model PTSD and compounds that we are investigating to treat PTSD within this model. So what do we know? We know that when animals are given MDMA, after the trauma and cue exposure, that their fear response to the cue is decreased the day after and the day after, and that this remains true in many more severe models of this simple paradigm. So they repeat this experiment, changing up many variables that are known to, to make that uh, the decreased fear response much more, much more challenging. And drugs often that are able to reduce fear response here no longer are able to in the more severe models, whereas MDMA does. I do want to take a second to highlight that this amazing paper came out by Matt Young, who is also an ASU alum. He was an undergraduate at ASU in the psychology department and worked in Dr. Cheryl Conrad's lab. So what Matt goes on to show in this study is they also showed increased um, neuronal plasticity within the amygdala. And when they blocked that MDMA-induced neuronoplasticity, the effects of MDMA were no longer effective, as in it no longer decreased the fear response, heavily suggesting, suggesting that the MDMA effects within the amygdala during the therapeutic um, experience are really are, are one of the biological mechanisms driving the decrease in symptoms or the decrease in fear response to, to innocuous cues. So next, we're going to talk about altered epigenetic regulation of stress genes. Again, this is preliminary data published by our lab in collaboration with MAPS and many other collaborators. This is the figure, if you remember, from the first phase three trial published in 2023. So what we were able to do is do a sub-study within this trial where we had sample collection happen at baseline, and we also had sample collection happen after the whole treatment paradigm. We looked at epigenetic changes in genes associated with the HPA axis. Dysregulation of the HPA axis has long been associated with PTSD. Um, and what we found was that epigenetic changes in the HPA genes we investigated predicted uh, decreased symptoms within PTSD. So to un unpack that for you a little bit, what you're looking at is the three genes that we looked at the change in their epigenetic scores on your x-axis and the change in their depression symptoms is on the y-axis. And as you can see across all three genes, um, the change in epigenetics predicted the change in symptoms. While this was true across both MDMA and placebo groups, um, by looking at the data, you can clearly see that the effect is much stronger in the MDMA treated group. So in summary, Checking my time. Okay, in summary, uh, we talk about that MDMA induces unique behavioral effects and that therapists have understood its application in the therapeutic process since the beginning. Phase three has been completed. Regulatory approval is expected to come soon-ish. However, we still have a lot of knowledge gaps, particularly in optimizing the treatment model. And we discussed evidence for potential um, mechanisms 
for treatment response. However, I do want to highlight that none of these mechanisms negate the other, and it is most likely all three of them happening in synergy for, um, for such strong treatment effects. So lastly, I want to tell you guys a little bit about the Bear Lab initiatives that are happening right here in Arizona. The Bear Lab, Sarah and I run together. It is the Brain Epigenetics and Altered States Research. You can find us at that handle or that website. And um, we have initiated the Translational Research and Psychedelics Group, which is housed under the College of Health Solutions. This is, there's a group of about 60 of us that is comprised of therapists, doctors, professors, researchers, and students who are all interested in um, increasing translational speed of this of this science into medical practice. And we're all within the Phoenix Valley. Two, psychedelic crowd. This is in collaboration with Mind Crowd, which is a study ran by Tijin. And we are assessing the effects of um, past psychedelic use and cognitive function in a large web-based global cohort, cohort. And we are happy to say that we are actually launching this study today. And I will give you an opportunity on how you can um, participate. Last but not least, we are initiating the Psychedelic Genome Project that we um, lovingly refer to as the PGP. This will be the first centralized biological sample repository across the world where we are wanting to um, recruit and collect samples from psychedelic clinical trials across the world and samples from basic science psychedelics across the world. This will enable the very first uh, deep dive into the genomic regulators of psychedelic therapies. That's it. It's a short time. I would love to give it over to Sarah so you can learn about psilocybin. I'd like to thank the School of Life Sciences and Psychology and, of course, Trip and the College of Health Solutions, the Bear Lab with our wonderful three graduate students, Tana, Allison, and Samantha, our Bear Cubs, the undergraduate team that support us all, which there are a lot of them, and always the research participants, the road subjects. And again, psychedelic crowd, and you may take a moment to scan that if you want, and we can always put it back up in the end if you want to be a participant in our psychedelic crowd study. Wow. Um, great stuff. And thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I told you it was going to be great. Our next presenter, Sarah Menenga, is going to give a presentation on psilocybin, basic science and clinical research. And we are excited to have her. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'm going to share my screen here and take it away. All right, so uh, my name is Sarah Meninga. I'm a research assistant professor here at ASU. I am um, also an ASU alum. I did my undergrad and graduate work here. And uh, after a stint in New York, I have rejoined uh, the ASU faculty just this past summer. Um, and I'm very happy to be back here um, and working with uh, Candace Lewis uh, on several different studies related to psychedelics. So, I'm going to give a parallel presentation to what Candace just completed, but I'm going to talk to you all about psilocybin, which is um, kind of neck and neck with MDMA in terms of recent clinical progress and information from the basic science world about potential mechanism underlying some of these uh, clinical effects. So brief overview, I will start with a basic introduction to psilocybin as well as its cousins, the classic psychedelics. A uh, brief history of the use of psilocybin across time. And then I'm going to give you all a pretty high level summary of all of the different published studies with psilocybin that have come out across the past 15 years or so. Uh, I'll highlight a few knowledge gaps that are still remaining and talk about the treatment model with psilocybin, which is similar but different uh, from MDMA. I'm gonna to touch briefly on what we know about the role of the psychedelic experience itself in the clinical effects of psilocybin. And then I'm going to touch very, very briefly on some rodent models of these clinical studies. One in particular, I'll talk a little bit about uh, because it gives a really good example of behavioral changes that coincide with changes in structural neuroplasticity, which we think uh, might be part of the mechanism underlying these effects. Although like Candace pointed out, uh, similar to MDMA, there's a lot of different uh, mechanistic changes that people have found following treatment with psilocybin recently. Likely all of them are involved, or at least many of them, in the behavioral changes we see in both rodents and clinical populations. So we'll start off with an introduction to psilocybin itself. Uh, psilocybin is a naturally occurring prodrug to another compound called psilocin, uh, which is actually psychedelic. So psilocybin itself 
um, does not contain any uh, psychedelic activity. It does not have a very high affinity for the serotonin 2A receptor, which is the receptor that uh, confers its psychedelic effects. Uh, rather, it is converted to a different compound called psilocin pretty rapidly. And this happens a couple of different ways. It, there's uh, enzymes in the liver that can cause this conversion, um, but psilocybin is also pretty rapidly converted to psilocin in the digestive tract just by the acidic environment uh, surrounding it. So anytime psilocybin is ingested, it is rapidly converted to psilocin, uh, which then makes its way uh, into your brain. The number one place that psilocybin uh, uh, occurs naturally is in mushrooms of the genus psilocybe. So this is a picture over here on the left of psilocybe cubensis, which is a commonly um, found mushroom that contains high levels of psilocybin. Uh, down on the kind of bottom middle area here, I have a picture of a different mushroom. It's this kind of red mushroom with the like puppy white spots on it. Um, and oftentimes you'll see pictures of this mushroom alongside like media reports of research that we've done. Um, and I think it's kind of popularized because of the like Alice in Wonderland cartoonage. Um, but this is actually a very different psychedelic mushroom. This is uh, Amanita muscaria, which is also known as fly agaric. Um, and it contains a totally different compound called uh, mucimol, which is very different from psilocybin. So don't mix them up. Psilocybin is often referred to as a classic psychedelic, um, and it has a couple of classic psychedelic cousins that are grouped along with it. Um, two that you'll hear about pretty often are LSD and DMT. And uh, the main reason that these drugs are sort of um, grouped together is that they produce similar alterations in perception, cognition, affect, um, a sense of meaning, and one's sense of self. Also, and importantly, all of these drugs do this via agonist activity at the serotonin 2A receptor. Uh, so this is information that we've known for decades, uh, but really exactly how interactions with the serotonin 2A receptor uh, kind of uniquely create the psychedelic state when psilocybin or rather psilocin comes along, and this does not happen when something like serotonin binds the receptor, has long been um, a pretty big mystery in science. So I'll take you back over a very brief um, history of the use of psilocybin across time. Um, there's a lot of other things that have happened in this time frame with the other classic psychedelics, LSD and um, DMT, but I'm for the sake of this 15 minute presentation, I'm gonna keep it, keep it pretty tight on psilocybin. Uh, so we'll start with uh, indigenous use that happened pretty widely um, prior to the 16th century. Um, there's a lot of cultures throughout South and Central America that have surviving written documentation of um, ceremonial use of psilocybin containing mushrooms dating back at least a thousand years. Unfortunately, in the 16th century, um, Spanish conquistadors for whatever reason, made it a goal of theirs to seek out and destroy um, many of these writings in particular. So a lot of the evidence of this was destroyed, but not all of it. Um, some of it did survive throughout the decades. And if we fast forward to May 13th, 1957, this is a big leap in time, um, but this was an important date in the history of psilocybin containing mushrooms. Um, on this day, there was a photo essay published in Life magazine uh, written by R. Gordon Wasson and it was called Seeking the Magic Mushroom. And this is where the popularization of the term magic mushroom has like come from in Western society. Uh, so this was a photo essay um, that him and his wife compiled uh, and they went down to uh, Mexico and they took uh, psilocybin containing mushrooms from a curandera named Ava Mendez that she's pictured here down below. Um, and they, in pictures, uh, documented the entire journey that they took along with several other folks um, that came with them. And up until this point in time, um, there had been a number of people that had had the opportunity to travel down to Central or South America and personally take these mushrooms. Um, but it was really um, kind of, uh, it, was, it was not very popular. Very few people of Western society had any access to this. Um, and it was still kind of a mythology whether or not these magic mushrooms really were widely accessible. Um, this put that to rest. And basically, uh, at this point in time, when this uh, uh, photo essay came out, LSD had been discovered a little over a decade before. People had experimented with it, understood a little bit about psychedelic effects. Um, and so the society was, was ready to accept psilocybin uh, mushrooms as a new cousin to LSD. 
So uh, about uh, almost 10 years later, Albert Hoffman followed up on his uh, prior synthesis of LSD with a patent for synthesizing uh, psilocybin and psilocin. Um, although throughout this time, um, very little psilocybin or psilocin was actually synthesized. Almost everything was done uh, with naturally occurring uh, psilocybin containing mushrooms. Move forward another almost 10 years and uh, we're at 1970, which is where um, due to a lot of political reasons that I don't have time to cover, uh, psilocybin was placed on uh, the schedule one docket when the Controlled Substances Act was placed into law. And, and so as Candace touched on uh, just a bit ago, the schedule one classification by definition basically federally labeled psilocybin as having zero clinical value. And when you federally label someone as having zero clinical value, a consequence of that is that there are zero dollars of federal funding that are available to study this compound's clinical value, which makes sense. Um, but it put psilocybin in a bit of a catch-22, uh, because at this point, there were no dollars available to study any potential clinical uses of psilocybin, which made it um, impossible to approach and this legal classification. So prior to scheduling, there was about a 20-year research boom um, with classic psychedelics, mostly LSD. There was a little bit going on with psilocybin, um, but LSD was very widely used clinically for the treatment of alcoholism, as well as anxiety and depressive symptoms, um, and pretty much all came to a halt uh, in 1970. Luckily, uh, there's been a second psychedelic clinical research boom that we are currently kind of in the midst of and that I was lucky enough to contribute to in my last appointment, um, and hopefully more coming soon. Uh, this time, we're mostly focused on psilocybin, uh, but the indications are pretty similar to what was studied back in the 50s and 60s. So with that, I'm going to cover in the next two slides, um, basically an overview of all of the different indications and trials that have been done with psilocybin in the last 15-ish years or so. The first slide I'm gonna to devote to things related to anxiety and mood symptoms. And then the next slide I'm going to talk about uh, substance use and other psychiatric indications. So there's three main pockets really of uh, research that fall into this anxiety depression category. Uh, the earliest studies that came out in the early 2010s were in cancer patients that had uh, co-occurring anxiety or mood disorders related to their cancer diagnosis. Uh, and there are a lot of reasons why research was chosen to be done in cancer patients to begin with, partially because it was a sympathetic population and people thought that it was a low hanging fruit in terms of FDA approval. Um, I don't know if they were right or wrong, but we got it done. <laughs> Um, and then closely on the heels of those studies were additional um, ever increasing efforts uh, aimed at FDA approval of psilocybin for major depressive disorder and uh, treatment resistant depression in particular. So there's been a lot of trials across the last 15 years or so, um, but I think we can pretty much uh, visualize them all pretty well with this like nice little sample size triangle. So we start in 2011. Uh, Charlie Grobe published the very first uh, cancer anxiety trial in a sample of 12 people. This was a randomized double-blind crossover trial. Um, everyone got uh, the drug or placebo in a random order. And then over the next 10 years, between 2011 and 2021, we turned out five additional trials, um, which is a lot considering there was zero federal funding supporting all of this research. Um, but all of the sample sizes you can see are really hovering between like 20 and 60 people. And when you're talking multiple treatment groups, multiple doses, 10 to 30 people per group is really not a huge clinical trial sample. Um, the main goal of all of these trials, they got a lot of publicity and a lot of media attention and they were very exciting and encouraging. Um, but the main goal of all of these trials was to show um, safety and feasibility of delivering psilocybin to different clinical populations. Um, and they did provide overwhelming support for that. In the last two years, um, a couple of really sizable multi-site um, trials have come out that are powered for efficacy outcomes. One from USONA Institute, which is a nonprofit uh, uh, psychedelics company, and one from Compass Pathways, which is a, a for-profit institute that's also studying psychedelics, uh, psilocybin in particular. Um, this uh, paper from Compass in particular has 200 plus uh, research participants across 22 sites. 
um, and does provide uh, some uh, evidence for efficacy of psilocybin in the treatment of uh, treatment resistant depression. So I'm going to move on then to the addiction and other psychiatric indications that have been studied with psychedelics. Um, the two addiction uh, uh, substance use categories that have been looked at are alcohol use disorder and smoking cessation. Um, and then the other psychi psychiatric indications that have been looked at are obsessive compulsive disorder and anorexia nervosa. And I can throw up basically the same uh, sample size triangle here where you can see the first, you know, uh, almost 20 years of research actually we're hovering around 10 or 15 uh, people per study, which is pretty small. Um, again, good evidence for safety and feasibility. Uh, and then just last year, uh, we, me and my uh, postdoc uh, colleagues from Michael Bogenschutz's lab at NYU, Langone, just published uh, in JAMA Psychiatry, the first adequately powered for efficacy trial of psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy for alcohol use disorder. Um, so we had 95 participants across two sites. It was a randomized double-blind uh, design. And uh, similar to the results in depression, uh, we showed rapid, um, very robust, and enduring uh, symptom reduction. Take-home point of all of this is that we're well on the way. The evidence is very promising, but we do need more trials, and they're getting bigger, and they're getting more expensive. So really, funding is needed to move this field forward substantially. The knowledge gaps that we have in the psilocybin uh, field are pretty similar to those that exist in the MDMA field. Um, something that I wanted to point out is that virtual, like the vast majority of participants in all of the trials that I've just described um, fall into uh, these bullet points right here. So for the most part, they are physically and otherwise psychologically healthy. Um, they're overwhelmingly white. They're of relatively high socioeconomic status. Most of them are postgraduate educated. Um, they're rather, they're middle-aged, which is uh, older on average than your average clinical trials participant. Um, and even though they all have psychiatric um, diagnoses, they are free of psychiatric medications. Um, so I say this like facetiously, but also quite seriously, you know, we're looking for like the healthiest people with alcohol use disorder that you can find for the sake of showing safety, feasibility, and a hint at efficacy. So same um, limitations. We really have put no money into comparing different administration platforms. We don't know anything about drug-drug interactions. We have no evidence for how this might be behaving in more diverse groups. Um, don't know much about mechanism or whether the psychedelic experience itself is playing a role or is necessary for the clinical outcomes that we're looking at. I'm gonna to touch just very briefly on each of these three things in the next couple of minutes. Um, and I could give an hour long talk about any one of them. So I'll keep it short. Uh, the current psilocybin treatment model is pretty similar to what's done with MDMA with a couple of um, exceptions. It has three components, pretty similar to what Candace described. Uh, the first component is some sort of evidence-based psychotherapy. The second is preparation, support, and integration sessions uh, surrounding the actual drug uh, delivery. And then the third is the actual psilocybin treatment itself. Uh, the different types of evidence-based psychotherapy that are included largely depend on which indication we're talking about. So for um, alcohol use disorder, we usually do a combination of like motivational interviewing, cognitive behavioral therapy approaches. Um, the cancer studies use a lot more psychodynamic psychotherapy and some um, palliative care informed uh, approaches. Uh, the preparation, support, and integration sessions are almost identical to what is done in the MDMA literature. We prepare people for what to expect. It's largely non-directive, facilitative, um, and basically we're there to help should it be needed, but most of the work is done by the participant themselves. And uh, the psilocybin treatment model itself has not been explored deeply. Um, the model currently that everyone uses is to increase the dose as high as you possibly can without hitting too many adverse effects. Um, and the idea in the field currently is that there is an important role of the subjective psychedelic experience in the clinical outcomes, um, but really not a lot of evidence yet supporting that. So how do we even measure a psychedelic experience to know if it is important for clinical outcomes? Um, unfortunately for our participants, the answer currently is a lot of scales, <laughs> like, a, like hundreds and hundreds of questions about this experience, mostly on a computer, which is really difficult for a person who's just taken psilocybin to do um, and questionable in terms of data quality. So there are a lot of scales. Um, I'm gonna just throw 
the top ones up here, along with all of the different subscales and factors that they measure. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of them, but I want to point out that they're almost entirely informed by um, individual people's personal experiences with psychedelics and what they think is normal um, to happen when you ingest something like this. Uh, there is some psychometric validation in here, but not very much. Um, and there's really nothing that is uh, not self-report that anyone is using currently other than like blood pressure um, measures, which are very reliable indicators, but not used. Um, so a goal of ours um, is to improve some of the measurement of psychedelic effects. I'll summarize all the literature and say that there's a lot of correlations between higher scores on many of these scales and better improvement on many symptoms, um, which suggest a role of the psychedelic experience. But there's also a lot of rodent models that um, very much call this into question. I'm going to tell you just a little bit about one mouse study that's been done. This is really the very first study that was done showing a behavioral change in mice corresponding with some sort of um, structural change that might be a mechanistic underpinning of the effect. Um, this is their graphical abstract that basically shows a high level summary of what they did. Uh, the first thing that they did was uh, elicit learned helplessness behavior in mice through um, putting mice in a paradigm where they are given inescapable shock. Um, after several repeated uh, times in this task, uh, most animals will develop learned helplessness behavior where even if they are given an opportunity to escape, they will fail to do so. And um, in this paper, they show that psilocybin, but interestingly not ketamine, uh, reduces uh, escape failures and so therefore reduces learned helplessness in this model of um, uh, stress-induced uh, behavioral deficit. Um, also, alongside this behavioral effect, uh, these folks also showed um, some really nice two-photon imaging across a month of time, um, which pretty convincingly um, provided evidence that there is increased uh, growth and persistence of dendritic spines following treatment with psilocybin in cortical neurons. Um, these new spines persist for up to a month. And they did just a little bit of slice physiology showing that um, psilocybin also increases uh, miniature excitatory postsynaptic currents, which is a brief indication that um, some of these spines at least are likely functional synapses with other cells. So to describe in 30 seconds what we know about the mechanism underlying the effects of psilocybin, um, I'm gonna put things in three different pots here. The first pot is the mechanism underlying the psychedelic effects. The second is the pot underlying clinical effects. And then the third is the pot that we think might be conjoining these two, which is what mechanisms are underlying the neuroplastic effects of these drugs. For example, the growth of new spines as shown in the shell paper that I just talked about. Um, really how these three things overlap with each other and whether psychedelic effects or neuroplastic effects are required for clinical effects or any other combination of the three um, is, is totally unknown right now. There has been no research um, convincingly showing any of these things. With one exception, which I don't have time to talk about today, but I encourage you if you're interested to read it. Um, this is a paper that came out earlier this year in Science um, from David Olson's group. Uh, Maximiliano Vargas is the first author, and um, this paper points us toward a previously unappreciated pool of intracellular serotonin 2A receptors that um, they provide pretty convincing evidence is underlying both the psychedelic and the neuroplastic effects of psychedelic drugs. Uh, so with that cliffhanger, I will... Uh, go ahead and uh, thank the Bear Lab, uh, TRIP, the School of Life Sciences, the College of Health Solutions, all of our research participants, um, and of course our rodent su uh, subjects. The QR code right here is the same one that Candace provided at the end. So if you didn't get a chance to screenshot it before and you'd like to participate in Psychedelic Crowd, you have another moment now. Um, great stuff, amazing. Um, I think, a lot of the comments in the Q&A are already like, how do I get involved and how do I uh, contact the Bear Lab? And so I think the, the bearlab.org or that QR code, um, that's pretty exciting. Some students want to get involved, so be prepared for that. Um, I had some great questions and somebody asked about access to the papers that you're referencing. Um, I don't know if that's something that we could kind of just send directly or, um, you know, yeah. We can, um, yeah, we have a, we have a lab um, 
uh, reading like list like Zotero, we can we can compile definitely a clinical psychedelics uh, reading list of citations and send it around to folks. Yeah. Is there any evidence, this probably for both of you, is there any evidence for using psilocybin, LSD, or DMT to treat TBI? And I assume that you mean total brain injury or um, very devastating sort of disease that we see sometimes in medicine. Uh, it's a great question. Um, there's a lot of interest in it. Uh, the answer is no, not really. There hasn't been any uh, focused studies on it that have been completed and published. Um, but there is evidence in some animal models um, that there's anti-inflammatory effects of psilocybin um, and uh, pro-cognitive effects. So to the extent that those are the endpoints that you're trying to reduce, it would be a good um, idea. But yeah, no, there hasn't been any uh, trials completed that I'm aware of. So I'll follow up on that in that we have a local investigator in town, Dr. Lipschitz, who is currently running trials looking at ketamine in addition to psilocybin in TBI models for traumatic brain injury in there in animals. So data is coming. And I think as Sarah was saying, there's a lot of promising evidence of it. You know, I think there's a lot of questions that I'd like to summarize one way to say people are asking about, yeah, sure, maybe there's a little bit of a positive effect, but what about long-term damage, long-term negative effects, and what do we know, you know? Um, I'll briefly say about the MDMA trial since there's way less to cover, and Sarah can go to that, go to her multiple compounds. So yes, the trials do um, do include measures of adverse effects in the long-term and in the and in the present day trials. Um, for the MDMA trials, no severe adverse effects are reported. Uh, very few participants do report moderate effects um, or low effects. Um, maybe in, mostly it was like in a decreased mood. However, all of these participants also reported long, long-term positive effects. Oh, and then there was also the drug abuse question. Um, no, most of these trials also do follow that. And no one, to my knowledge, has ever found any evidence of these trials leading to abuse of the compound of interest and or any other drugs of abuse. Wow, that's pretty exciting. Um, somebody also, wrote... I'm going to supplement that just briefly with... Yeah, uh, with <laughs> Um, so it was very similar for the most part. Um, so yeah, we also, we track, um, adverse events over time. Uh, there are no serious adverse events that don't resolve, um, that we think are drug related. Um, there are low level persisting, like, uh, the adverse events that we tend to get typically are things like headache, nausea, things that you would expect from ingesting psilocybin. They all tend to resolve. Um, they all do resolve. Uh, and there are a couple of um, instances of folks reporting persisting um, changes in the way that their perception works, not permanently. And I think possibly this might be where some of the kind of lore around like flashbacks comes from. Um, it's happened maybe in two people, maybe twice each. Um, and both times it was like, oh, I, you know, had a moment where like a sound really sounded magical to me and it brought me back to that moment and it was very pleasurable and then it was gone. Um, so when I say changes in perception, I don't mean like someone is walking down the street and then they, you know, thought they saw a dragon. I mean, there's a moment when they're listening to music or there's some sort of sensory um, input that feels differently to them and that quality reminds them of something they experienced on the drug. Um, so there definitely are, um, you know, likely some very mild lasting effects, um, not uh, adverse and um, uh, yeah, nothing, nothing um, concerning that has uh, give, given rise to anyone. The biggest concern with psilocybin is blood pressure, cardiac effects. Um, it does widely increase uh, blood pressure. So we are careful to watch that. You know, uh, I think we're not the first country to pursue this. And people are asking questions along, have you looked at Latin America? Have you looked at aggregate data for people who pursue these alternative therapies? And can you give a quick maybe summary of those in, in both your fields? In a um, minute. <laughs> yeah, so I am, I am unaware of any published aggregate data of underground MDMA therapy use. That data is so hard to come by, as you can imagine. However, in the ayahuasca world or in the DMT world, there is lots of literature looking at both um, the church that has federal rights to be for its members to be using ayahuasca. So that population studied quite a bit. And then also um, going in and following these underground ayahuasca retreats, both here in the States and also in other countries where it's not underground. Um, so again, this like that observational convenience sample, again, shows really, really promising effects. Yeah. 
overall, um, and people who use classic psychedelics both recreationally and um, for ceremonial purposes have lower rates of substance abuse and lower rates of other psychiatric disorders than general population, and also in the United States, lower rates of uh, criminal recidivism. And we're really excited with the psychedelic uh, crowd. Psychedelic crowd study will be recruiting participants from around the world to self-report past psychedelic use. In relation to cognitive function, they'll be doing tasks on the computer and also self-report of things like emotional health and um, cognitive flexibility and perceived stress. So all these kind of subclinical measures that one would presume if these psychedelic therapies are so effective in clinical measures that we should be able to be seeing some, some of this data and also the day-to-day -day life subclinical factors. Excellent, excellent. There's a lot of people that talk about microdosing psilocybin versus using larger doses. Uh, can you comment on that uh, very briefly? There is interest. There has been studies. The evidence is not strong. Um, most of the effects seem to be driven more by expectation bias than actual drug. So it's hard to say. But design has not been great. So we don't know. Okay. And what very, are... very little. I just want to point out because we get this question all the time. And I think it's so important that the world understands the massive amount of attention that's come to microdosing. Um, is antidotally driven. So like the amount of published studies out there are just like this much. Um, clinical designs, yeah. And even that, and even them, they're like, they're iffy. Clinical designs are not out there. Um, all of the hype around it is very much purely antidotally driven. So when people ask me about it, the best I can say to them is from our self-report data, we, we even there, we see that some people are reporting beneficial effects. Some people also about equal report like, eh, I kind of made me anxious and I didn't do much. So don't, don't, yeah, I just think it's so important that people know that microdosing is not what the data is following right now. However, it will give us 10 years to get some clinical trials out. <laughs> Maybe uh, we could wrap up with this question. Somebody asked, is there anything being done with mescaline? And I want to integrate that into another one because we're here to, I guess, to educate and move the science forward. And what advice would you give to students looking to help conduct research on the biological mechanisms behind psychedelics? So we have a young undergraduate student, or maybe not young, but undergraduate students looking to move the science forward with this. And what would you recommend as a career path? I don't know of anything being done in mescaline in a clinical trial way, or, or even basic science. Sarah, you? There's some older stuff in addiction. Um, currently, I don't know of anything actively dosing people with mescaline. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of combine those into two because somebody also said, you know, or psychedelics, you know, kind of moving. How did they get involved in psychedelic research? So now oh, yeah, I was saying about you this take part. that part. Take yeah, that part. so for our lab um, at the moment, we are bursting at the seams full. Um, and I think that we always have a very long line of interested undergraduate students. So how we do that is at the end of every spring semester, we do a week of interviews and at that point, we choose a team that we ask for a commitment of at least three semesters. However, um, our team right now is very happy where they are, and I don't see a lot quitting, so I'm not sure how many spots will open up in the spring. However, the more funding we get and the more grants we get, the more we'll need. So we'll, we, will keep, we will keep our availability updated on our website. Is there a degree I should pursue? Is there a website I should go to? Is there a podcast I should listen to? I love this question, Frank. Thank you. The amount of students I've had come up to me over the years to say, how do I become a psychedelic researcher? My answer is become a researcher. <laughs> so no, there is not a program that's going to get you fast shot into psychedelic research. You need to do your studies as an undergraduate. You need to prepare for a PhD program, either in neuroscience, psychology, or clinical applications. And from there, you're going to develop the skills that you can choose to apply to psychedelic science. Psychedelic science is science. You need to become a scientist. Awesome. That's great. Great advice. You know, thank you. I don't have enough time. Hopefully we won't get some hate mail. We missed a couple of questions there. And I'll uh, try to answer them. <laughs> you you know, to answer we can go fast. <laughs> okay. uh, we encourage you to follow the College Health Solutions on social media um, so they can learn more about opportunities like this one. Our health talks will continue in January. Uh, please register at asuhealthtalks.com. And uh, thank you once again. Um, we appreciate your time and effort. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.